Hi everyone, I'm John Williamson. I uh, hope you had a good first session. And I'm here to tell you about um, my dissertation, which I wrote as a hard-boiled detective novel um, about the quasi-psychological edi um, educational category of students labeled uh, slow learners. So it was in education research curriculum that um, the dissertation was, was done in, although I just used the passive voice there and I don't know why I did because it didn't feel very passive when I was doing it. In the Journal of Applied Hermeneutics, um, where um, sort of inspired by some of the Victorian novels and Charles Dickens. Um, um, Nancy Moles, the editor of the journal, has been releasing, um, releasing this dissertation in like serial releases. And so we're almost done. I'm just editing part, um, part five right now, taking out of some of the slightly more boring parts that I no longer need because it's no longer a dissertation. Um, and uh, just having all the really hard pedagogic action in there. Um, and so you can read parts one to four now. Um, part five will be coming out like really soon within the next couple of weeks. Um, and I, I would actually encourage you to um, seek out the dissertation in that form as opposed to its original form. They're pretty close. But like I said, the, the journal version just is a little bit faster. I only use like one example of many of the truth claims as opposed to like, you know, four examples when I really had to prove that I knew what I was talking about. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm going to tell you uh, why I chose to write a detective novel. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the challenges that I faced. If you have a question that you're just dying to ask, feel free to interrupt me. I'm a high school teacher. I'm used to that. OK. So I don't want, I went a little bit long last time. And I don't want anybody to um, leave with a burning curiosity that's unanswered, uh, if that's OK. Um, next slide, please. So that's me in the 1970s. Um, uh, I grew up in Westlock, Alberta. Next slide. <laughs> um, that is my first book. Uh, it is a comic book I wrote about being chased by the police in the small town of Westlock, Alberta, getting caught, um, getting sent to a dungeon, and then escaping from the police on, on a BMX bike with my friend. Uh, and they put it, um, they, the school where I was going um, thought it was funny, I guess. I don't think it's very appropriate looking back. But, um, and they put it like in, in the West, Westlock St. Mary um, Elementary School Public Library and I was like, hey, I'm an author. And then, you know, I kind of always felt like I was an author after that. Um, however, my educational journey through school was not a smooth one because I have a learning disability or at least I had what they called learning disability. Well, the 1970s, 80s version of learning disabilities. So um, the manifestation in my case was a lot of clumsiness, which I still sort of have. Um, um, if you don't get anything else out of this talk, you're going to get a lot of entertaining gesticulating. Um, and uh, it also involved, um, like I couldn't count properly, as in it seems like all of the elementary school curriculum, and I'm probably exaggerating, but it seemed like all of it was like counting how many dots were on the ladybug's wings, OK? Which is a little bit of a problem if you don't remember which dots you've already counted, which I was constantly not remembering. So it had nothing to do with my visual, um, you know, like 2020, that kind of thing. It was more like I just couldn't keep track. Um, and it also brutally affected my handwriting, even though I was a really good writer. And so. Um, I already sort of got some feelings in school that I wasn't someone who belonged as a result of those experiences. Uh, however, I did manage to barely escape um, the Alberta education K-12 system and then barely get into Red Deer College where I discovered I actually had some ability. Um, so I did an English degree, history degree, Bachelor of Education after degree. I didn't really think of myself as like disabled because that wasn't a word people really used when I was going to school. So um, I, I certainly didn't try to direct my teaching experiences towards that, except I got um, surplused because I was the newest um, teacher at a school from being an English teacher into a program that was called the Integrated Occupation Program, then called the Knowledge and Employability Series of Classes, um, specifically designed for students um, uh, with the unofficial um, educational categorization of slow learner. 
basically a, a slow learning student according to this um, category that I no longer really believe strongly in uh, is a student with academic failure and a low average IQ. Okay, so it's like our 70 to 89 type of IQ combined with not doing very well in school. That is the program, um, or that is the student that this um, series of classes that I was teaching was intended for. Um, and um, and I, f I found I actually really liked teaching uh, knowledge and employability classes, or IOP as they used to be called. Um, I experienced the students as quite competent despite whatever was said about them. Um, I found we had a lot in common because even though we had different learning issues, we had learning issues and so we had that feeling of not belonging in schools. Um, and, and so it was a place that I really you know, found myself, even though I didn't ask to go there, I wanted to stay there um, as, as a form of teaching. Uh, and um, um, this is our uh, son, Jacob. He was our uh, second born, um, a beautiful kid, uh, um, very, uh, loving, um, happy, uh, some interesting things about Jacob. Um, he couldn't uh, walk when he was three, but um, if my daughter walked into the room, he'd like follow her so keenly with his eyes, it was almost like he was flying, like he'd skip walking altogether. Um, another cool thing about Jacob was whenever um, we knocked anything over, a lot of babies, and he was still kind of like a baby, and even like three and four, um, a lot of babies will cry with loud noises, but he just thought they were hilarious. <coughs> so anytime like something fell over in the kitchen or whatever, um, he would just like break out in uproarious laughter. So that was pretty endearing. And you know, I knock things over a lot, so I was you know maybe a great entertainer. Um, uh, Jacob passed away in two thousand and five, um, and you know it was a, a privilege having him in our family for as long as we did. Uh, and it really showed me a lot more about the complexity of difference. It showed me how difficult it can be to be a parent of a child with a disability, not because of the child, but because of the bureaucratic procedure that's involved in um, getting all the services that you require. So I'm like, you know, if my wife and I were not highly educated and really good at filling out paperwork, where would we be, right? Um, I also realized that there's huge differences in how people um, interpret um, difference. So some of the most inclusive people uh, were my parents-in-laws who are both farmers that just really seemed to get it. Um, and he was just a part of the family, you know. Um, curiously, however, when Jacob was um, born, I did have somebody tell me they were sorry. When he passed away, I did have somebody tell me it was for the best. And both of those people were teachers. Um, so again, my mind is just reeling with all of these ideas about how people take up and interpret difference. I then moved on to become a diverse learning coordinating teacher. So I was still working with slow learning students, but I was now also working with all of the students in the school that had any kind of label. Um, I was in charge of all of the site-based services um, for basically a student who was an English language learner, uh, um, learning disability label, um, still the um, slow learning students, the way they organize things at my school, gifted, basically everything. And I've been doing that, I still do that now, so I've been doing that since 2005. Um, some things I you know, started to figure out um, as a result of all of this is, it's like, like Ian Hacking said, and I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't some Frequently, there isn't some neurobiological basis to impairment, but also we tend to make people up around their impairments. Uh, and so these are all things that I discovered was in the literature um, about slow learners and who they are, their, their ontology as students, based on having an IQ of like 75 or 80, okay? Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, I, I worry that I'm sounding bossy when I'm, but so I don't, there's no other way. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, this is this is more like what I discovered. 
incredible complexity behind every single student with this label, okay? There are so many ways to become a slow learner, be they socioeconomic, um, behavior, um, uh, could, could be sexuality or gender identity. We had one student that we couldn't figure out exactly why um, he was being referred to our program. He was, wasn't the most hardworking student, but he wasn't really, really struggling either, except that it was a small program with a limited amount of students, um, a little bit cut off from like the other larger high school classes and it was like uh, 15 years ago or um, well, 10 to 15 years ago and he was uh, self-identified as gay and he was quite flamboyant. And I think they really just thought that this would be a place that would be more comfortable for this student as well as his teachers and classmates to put him in the slow learner program. And there's all kinds of stories like that. That's what we're constantly experiencing is that these these programs just become a place to put people who don't fit, right? Um, next slide, please. And so by now I have what I would consider a head full of hornets about all of this. Um, and so I decide to do a PhD, basically just to make sense of all of this. Um, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Field, who I'd highly, highly recommend as a supervisor for anyone who's in education, um, um, was somebody that had been on my supervisory committee when I did my MA. Uh, I also knew him as an undergraduate when I did my B.Ed. after. Um, and so I called him up and I said I was in interested in investigating the category of slow learner. And then he was like, I sort of had to talk him into it a little bit, but then he was on board. Um, and so we went ahead and it was, but I didn't want to just investigate it like clinically. Because, all, because as far as I could tell, most of the clinical investigation about slow learners had not been helpful. Um, so I wanted to explode it in all of its complexity. So, and not only the complexity of students with this particular label in this particular program um, that is really underfunded in Alberta, uh, that has a really poor graduation rate compared to the amount of students that would be labeled slow learners, uh, and which orders a credential, or which um, offers a credential for students that stay in IOP or K&E, um, that are, um, do not graduate with a high school diploma. It's called an IOP or K&E certificate, that only 1% of Alberta students um, earn, and that basically is no better than dropping out of high school in terms of what it will get you in, in terms of post-secondary, okay? Um, also, I sort of came to understand that the larger special education system was a bit of a mess also. Um, so there was this huge reform effort called setting the direction um, that then became this policy called action on inclusion. And um, this was in the early 2000s. At some point, action on inclusion made one significant change with the funding model of how students with disabilities are funded. Now every student in Alberta, um, there's some uh, diverse learning funded funding attached to every single Alberta student, whether they have a disability or not, as opposed to like $15,000 for a student with a severe um, mental health disability. So and that may, may have actually been a positive change. However, that was the only change. Nothing has changed about Alberta's um, um, coding system, uh, about their accommodations policies. Basically, there's been no major change um, in inclusive education, special education, since the very beginning of the massive uh, setting direction reform from a long time ago. That's all still underway. And at one point, um, my, um, my friend uh, uh, Chris Gillum and I were doing some research. We wrote a paper about this. And we discovered that over a very short period of time, the Action on Inclusion website um, was this rich repository of resources and policies that were moving forward. And then one day it just said action on inclusion no longer exists as an initiative. So this massive uh, special education reform as far, far as any practitioner in Alberta could tell just basically stalled, okay? So what I wanted to do with all of this is I wanted to explore it in its incredible complexity, okay? Um, I learned in a university course on detective fiction that I took because I already liked detective fiction and I wanted to learn more about it, um, that there's a bunch of different kind of mysteries. <coughs> One kind of mystery is golden age, 
That's like the Sherlock Holmes one where you have an upper class amateur detective um, that solves crimes in the sterile environment of his, mostly his own sitting room, um, um, uh, just by thinking really hard about them. Um, and then he goes and tells the answer to the cops who are too dumb to know the answer because they're working class, they're not amateurs, so if they have to do it for a living, they're probably not very good at it. Um, uh, tends to be somewhat conservative. Uh, the crime restores the just minor blip on the social order, or the, the crime, the solution of the crime restores the minor blip on the social order that uh, um, you know, the crime created and then everything just goes back to normal because we're dealing with a very stable social order. Hard-boiled, completely different, okay? Sometimes hard-boiled detectives don't even get around to solving the mystery. It's more about the atmosphere, the attitude, the environment, and the job, okay? It's about having a case that works on you as much as you work on the case, which is kind of like being an educator. And it's actually kind of like working with clients in any sort of educational, therapeutic, or social endeavor. Now, if you're going to uh, do this kind of thing, you have to prove that you know what you're talking about, okay? Um, one of my other committee members, uh, Dr. Jim Paul, put it pretty memorably when he said, you can't just look like you're screwing around with a detective novel. Um, so I, I read studied, interviewed everything I possibly could. I interviewed teachers, I interviewed students, I interviewed curriculum leaders. I studied disability history going back forever um, ago and I put it all in a disability history museum that the protagonist wanders through. Um, uh, I watched some movies, which wasn't that painful. Um, I read everything about Alberta um, education had ever said about slow learners, about um, vocational programming going back 100 years, and all the psychological data on these students in general that I could get my hands on, and some of that stuff was pretty painful to read. And it went over pretty well. I didn't just like barely get away with it, which I kind of thought was how, how it might go. <laughs> uh, Four out of um, five of my committee members loved it. Um, the one committee member who did not love it still really liked it. Um, he had a really good question, um, which is a good question for anybody that takes on an aesthetic form of research. He was very honest, and I might be over-characterizing it, but he basically said, I find this genre of writing alienating. It's macho and homophobic and sexist and violent, and like why, I, I just find it really hard to embrace it. <laughs> an educational mystery set in with this protagonist because it's not me. Like, I, I'm the client who hires this macho detective named Max Hunter to go and find the category of slow learners. So, and that was a fair criticism. Now, to his credit, he stuck with it. Um, he really respected the, the research and, and um, towards the end of the piece, he was getting into it a little bit more. So and I, think it was, I think it was a very fair and valid criticism um, of, of the work. However, uh, four out of five, I feel, I wanna say dentists for some reason. <laughs> uh, uh, four out of um, five people, uh, committee members really liked it. Um, um, as, as I mentioned, it's come out in the Journal of Applied Hermeneutics. Uh, it won the Chancellor's Medal um, um, in 2015. Uh, it's, it amuses me that with the breadth and depth of academia in these days, the, uh, the uh, um, Governor General's medal went to someone who, as I understand it, um, made it so satellites could have antennas that talk to each other more autonomously. And then they announced me at the luncheon and it's like, and John wrote a detective novel. <laughs> so, so it was amusing um, and, and also affirming, actually. Uh, I don't know, teachers, when they read it, are really enjoying it. Um, I have a lot of writer friends. I'm, I do slam poetry and things like that. And um, a lot of my friends that are in the writing community in general are enjoying it. Um, um, academics beyond my immediate um, you know, committee have been, have been enjoying it too since it came out. So basically, um, now I know a lot of these people, so if they didn't like it, they probably wouldn't tell me. But. Uh, but it, it's, it's been fairly well received, is, is I guess what I'm trying to say ever since it, it came out. 
Um, and I think it's probably going to um, continue to be well received in really uh, exposing and addressing the complexity with which we understand uh, difference in schools through the lens of slow learner, but also as it applies to everything that appears on the scene um, as an educational difference to us. Uh, I forget what's on the next slide. Oh, yeah, challenges. Um, it took forever. Uh, it took me five years. Um, I was teaching full time at the time, but I, like, I got up an hour and a half earlier than I would have otherwise, and I just wrote every morning. I figured, you know, if, uh, if I was going to have use all of my energy, I should do that right away because I'd be too tired after school. Um, it's really long, which was a problem in attracting a, um, supervisory committee members. No one wants to read a 500-page dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Until we found somebody that did, uh, Professor Nick Hodge from England, a, a, a disability studies scholar who, um, who took on the challenge and loved it, and actually wrote an editorial introducing part two of the serialization. And he's just a great writer about autism and other differences. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge. We went, we asked several people until Nick finally said yes. Um, uh, I'd have to find solutions for things. Like, I do. I spent like a. I, I hope the government wasn't watching me because I spent like a, a week just researching guns on YouTube because I didn't know anything <laughs> about guns. Uh, there's another um, one of my uh, characters gets thrown into a giant shredder machine because you know bureauc bureaucracy paper shredder. And I, so I, I spend like a couple of days just looking at how, how big they actually make shredders on YouTube. That's really big. You can shred a car. Did you know that? <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, so it's like you'd have to, I'd have to find all these fictive solutions that you don't have to find in a regular uh, dissertation because, you know, you don't have to say, I showed up for the interview. It was a cold and stormy, you know, night or anything. You just, you're there at the interview, right? Um, uh, formatting wasn't actually a huge problem. We thought it would be, but it wasn't. Um, um, basically, my committee went, or my the university accepted almost everything, so it was it was great that way. I found a very accepting audience, probably because Jim was a um, great advocate, and then also because the work was perceived as of quality. Um, I worried a lot about how this would go. And, and, you know, so this is all part of taking on um, an innovative dissertation. A lot of this is about taking on any dissertation, I think, anyways. Um, but I think, I think you have a greater uncertainty when you, when you try to, you know, be outside of the box a little bit. So I kind of, um, the character of Max Hunter, I voice in kind of a Clint Eastwood uh, accent. And, it was a messy case. They can all get messy, but this one got under my skin. I never should have agreed to it the day I got the call. Maybe I hadn't had enough Java that day, and my sense of danger was already in glorious repose. I was, to be sure, already tired as I squeaked open the office door of my office, already tired as I slouched into the desk. I hadn't had any business in a week, but I was still luxuriating in the rewards from that last case, a bruised jaw, a torn rotator cuff, a fractured love life, and a slight dimming of my already flickering pilot light of hope. I'd been paid out all right, in everything but fees, and even as I pondered the toll the last case had taken on me, I knew I would need a paying job soon. The rent for the office was due, and the dust bunnies in my care needed to be provided for in the style they'd grown accustomed to. I was torn between brewing a pot of java or treating myself to a drink from the office bottle at the bottom drawer of my desk. I just sat there, staring at the wall, waiting to see which impulse prevailed. I was watching some ants skittering up the wall like they were racing towards some kind of bounty, which I discovered private detectives spend a lot of times watching bugs climb walls, so I wanted to put that in there. Uh, uh, it might have been a speck of sugar from the day of the week before when I threw a mug, my mug of java against it. The one to bring it back to the queen would win a knighthood. Above them, a spider cruised along her web. They were racing toward her, her too. They were just too busy to notice. I didn't have the heart to tell them. The unfolding drama was interrupted by the ringing of my phone. I picked it up and was about to announce myself when the voice on the other end beat me to it. Is this Max Hunter? I considered asking if he was a tax collector or a jealous husband, but he sounded worried, and I didn't think a crack like that was necessarily appropriate. I answered to the affirmative. 
It's John Williamson. I'm calling from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm a teacher. I teach special education. Actually, I sort of coordinate special education at my school. Some of my students, the slow learners, they've all disappeared. And it's not just here, it's all across the province. So call the police. I've heard the Mounties always get their man. I can't. They don't handle cases where metaphysics are involved. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he sounded firm on the point. I switch gears. Why, why me? Sorry, voices. I was told you were hard-boiled. He'd done some research. This impressed me slightly. Can you afford me? Well, your usual rates are kind of steep for my department budget, but I need a professional on the case, and I have some money left. You'd have to save every receipt for expenses and, I'm sorry to say this, pay for your own drinks. I'm willing to meet to hear more, but no promises. At least it would get me out of the office and away from that bottom drawer. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. That's all I ask. I'll meet you at my school next Tuesday during the first morning tutorial at 7.56 a.m. And make sure you park in visitor, not teacher parking. And make sure you sign the book with your license plate number, make and model of car, and the staff member you are visiting, and the time of arrival. And be sure to collect a visitor's badge. <laughs> Can someone frisk me too? I asked, mocking the formality of the proposed liaison, but candidly relieved by the prospect of employment, despite my insouciant reply. <laughs>